so you just released The Best of Me in September. Uh, talk about that record. I love it. Oh, thank you so much. Well, a number of years ago, Ted Perlman, who's a wonderful producer, sent me an email and said, I would like to work with you. Let's, let's do some samples, some demos, etc." and this and that, and Best of Me was one of the first ones we did. And it kind of sat there and, okay, do we do a big project? And we recorded some more, and then is the time right or the circumstances right to release a regular album? And Tom Estee, my, my PR darling friend, said, this is ridiculous. These, let's get some of these tracks out. Everybody who's heard them loves them. And lo and behold, um, The Best of Me went to number one on the world indie chart in Europe. And I'm just flabbergasted. I'm amazed. I mean, it's, it's a fun record. And everybody, in fact, my 10-year-old grandson, Julian, who is Robin Thicke's son, my grandson, that's his favorite song of mine. He loves that song. And I thought, okay, there's something there. If a 10-year-old loves it, you know you're onto something. So... <laughs> Absolutely, 100%. So talk about the beginnings of your uh, music entertainment career. I know you come from a musical family. Was entering both these fields uh, always in the cards for you, always something that uh, interested you? I think so. I sang all the time when I was a kid. I sang in church choir. I sang in school productions. You know, and, and singing was uh, something that felt good. It does feel good. And I got recognition for it, and I got applauded, and people would smile, and and uh, it just felt like the natural thing to do. Uh, there wasn't any money for me to go to college. And so I started working when I was about 15, singing in a folk group called Those Four. And then that graduated to me singing with, I had a partner, duet partner, and we would work at small clubs around Miami. I was in Miami Beach at that time. And then um, an agent saw me and I got an agent and I started being booked across the country. And then then I did the Merv Griffin show and, you know, things just grew from there. So it was, it was a heady time. Yeah, that is absolutely wonderful. Now, talking about the transition from, from singing, obviously you, you kind of had a balance between singing and acting, but talk about that transition from the mic uh, to, to really uh, behind the camera. What was that like for you? What was finding that balance like? Well, um, I was a very shy person. And, and so acting didn't come naturally to me. Um, I studied and I had one teacher who was going in one direction that wasn't the best for me because uh, I wasn't getting any callbacks or anything. And then I found another teacher who really opened up my sense of what I was capable of doing. And um, that, that led to me going out three times in one week for calls and to read, to audition. And the third one was the Days of Our Lives audition, and I got it, and I stayed there for six and a half years as Liz Chandler. It was fun. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. Now, what was your reaction uh, finding out that you'd be playing Liz Chandler? I can't even imagine. Now, how many backflips did you do? <laughs> <laughs> I can't even do one. So, but, but I was very excited for a couple of reasons. One is that um, it was something new to do. And number two, I had a five-year-old and a three-year-old, and the five-year-old was just about to start uh, kindergarten, and I'd been traveling with them. Oh, yeah, please, you know, smashed banana all over my jeans on the airplane, and two toddlers, and I don't know how, I still don't know how I did that. I don't know how I did that, but um, I couldn't travel because Brennan would have to go to school, you know, go to kindergarten, and it was the right thing to do. And now I had this job in Los Angeles, and it was perfect. And for the next six and a half years, that's where I stayed. I want to go back for a second. Uh, you, you had said that you uh, were shy. I would kind of, and I'm, I'm going to make an assumption here, that, that singing, uh, being behind the mic, being in front of an audience, uh, probably did help you uh, in acting. Uh, would, would I be correct with that? Yeah, um, I had a sense of myself, and that helped me with the acting a lot. When I didn't wasn't quite what, knowing what to do with the the scene, I could stand and be self-contained, and uh, and project, you know, some feeling and whatever. But but what really helped was just doing the show, and having to you know three. I I we taped five days a week. I was usually on maybe two or three days a week, because we had forty some characters. Um, and, and would be just to 
have another kind of scene that I had to come up with, you know, how to play that scene. So it was a, an act, a six and a half acting class. And I worked with some wonderful people who taught me a lot. Yeah, absolutely incredible. Now, I, I am kind of curious because I feel like you'd be the best person to ask uh, about this because of your lengthy experience in acting and in music. How have uh, both of these industries uh, changed over time? Uh, I, I believe social media is probably a, uh, definitely an, an enormous factor in this uh, as well. Well, social media is the minor leagues of the entertainment industry because somebody can post a video and suddenly they're a star or, you know, a momentary star. Um, how has it changed? Well, it used to be there were little clubs all over the place and you travel to these little clubs and you got an agent and you got on, you know, one of the television shows. And like I did the Merv Griffin show 26 times in one year. Every two weeks, I did a Merv Griffin show. Well, that was huge. And, and then I did The Tonight Show, and I did all these other things. I did, like, hundreds of variety shows with Dean Martin and Ed Sullivan and Danny Thomas and, or, you know, just um, Red Skelton and amazing, amazing. And got to work, and Bob Hope, and got to work with all these people. And uh, so it was different. Now you're more likely to start on social media or The Voice, or one of those sorts of shows to, to work your way up. Yeah. I, I think that would be the difference. Real quick, I can't even imagine meeting Dean Martin. I'd, I'd literally be shaking. He, he is my all-time favorite musician. You know what? He was so cool and so easy going. You know, he was Dean, and it was all fine. <laughs> he was great. He made you feel immediately at ease. Oh, I love that. I totally wish I could have uh, met him. You've kind of touched on this, but... Uh, looking back, what, what have been some of your most memorable moments? Do any moments in particular kind of pop in the mind for you? I think being in Vietnam with Bob Hope and the, and the team of us that went over there uh, on the USO trip. Um, I had just gotten married. Uh, it was my first Christmas with my then husband, Alan Thicke. And uh, then I, well, I wasn't with him because I went away. I left before Christmas and came back just after New Year's. And uh, that was one, uh, singing on the Academy Awards. I sang two nominated songs on the Academy Awards, um, singing on the Emmys, um, singing the anthem for years for the Raiders. I was Al Davis's favorite, I'm told, favorite <laughs> anthem singer. So just, you know, I think just being with people and seeing that my music and myself could bring them some happiness was the best thing. Yeah, and you still do that today, uh, and, and so I thank you for that. Um, actually, fun little story, my mom uh, is an enormous fan of yours, and, and today when, when I showed her my interviewing schedule and you were on it, I'm pretty sure she almost fainted. Oh, <laughs> well, you tell her hello for me. I will. We, we have to talk about Friends and Lovers because that is still an enormous hit, and I, I want to go back. So at that time when, when that song was taking the world by storm, what was that like for you? Well, it was fun because I had been complaining about a year and a half ahead of time, ahead of when it hit number one, um, which, by the way, was the same week that my book was published. I left Days of Our Lives, my divorce became final, and Friends and Lovers went to number one, all in the same week. Yeah. Anyway, but um, I was complaining one day and thinking to myself, I'm never going to have a hit record because now everybody knows me as a soap opera actress and I'll never get a record and rah, 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 pity party, pity party, pity party. And um, my producer called me down in, the, uh, in my dressing room and said, when you have a break, come up and see me. I want to play you something. She said, this song was sent in for, to the show. And I said, oh, and she played me, what would you think if I told you? And I said, oh my God, that's a hit song if I ever heard one. And we decided to put it on the show right away. Like the next week I sang it, letters started to come in. It built up a following. Um, it actually became uh, the most popular ever piece of music on a, day a daytime television show on NBC. I believe and it. I know, I know. And then... Uh, we couldn't get any, we got turned down by all the major record companies. And then there was a small label. Yeah. They said, well, we're not doing duets. We're not doing waltzes. We're not doing ballads. We're not doing this. We're not doing that. And then this one little company, uh, Career Records, that was from a guy from France, took the record on. We reproduced it a little bit and uh, put it out. And it had been playing, I've been playing it on Days of Our Lives 
singing it every few weeks for almost a year. So by the time it came out, it just went right up to number one. There was no stopping it. Those people who turned it down must be feeling like a fool. Well, you know, I don't know. It's, it's hard to tell, you know. Yeah, yeah, true, hard true. To tell. <laughs> well, I'm happy that that song's in the world because it's brought a lot of people uh, so much joy. Oh, I've heard from so many people that it was their love song. One, one lady wrote me, now let me remember this story. Um, she was in, in high school and she and her friend, this boyfriend, um, were absolute born for each other, you know, and um, they got married and the years went by and they got divorce. No, they didn't get married. No, they separated. I'm sorry, I'm remembering the song wrong. They separated and his family moved out of town and they lost track of each other. And years later, her husband had died and she was thinking, I should get out there and just, you know, date a little bit. So she put an ad, personal ad, and she looked through the personal columns and one of them was titled, um, look, you know, whatever, 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 a guardian. And she said, that sounds, what a nice word to use. She contacted him and it was her boyfriend. Oh my goodness. And they connected after all that time. It turned out they didn't live very far from each other. And friends and lovers had been their love song when they were in high school. And they were about to get married and friends and lovers was going to be played at their wedding. That sounds like a Nicholas Sparks film. <laughs> I know, doesn't it? Yeah, 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 it does. I love, I love those stories. Oh my goodness, I do too. So, uh, Gloria, what is next for you? Uh, what, what are some of those goals for the rest of this year for 2021? You know what? I am actually retired from, from performance because the travel and I, I'm just at a stage in my life where I want a little simpler life, of course. And then COVID hit. And, you know, I haven't even, I won't even see my grandchildren now for another month or so. So it's, it's just a time for me. You know, I started working when I was 15 years old. That's, that's a long time ago. <laughs> that's a long time. So I'm, I'm ready to just be at home. I mean, this success of the best of me, and I think the, uh, some of the other records on that, the, the EP are, are going to get some play. And I mean, it's just a joy and it's, it just comes out of nowhere and makes me very happy. It makes Ted Perlman, my darling producer, very happy. But, but I don't think I'm going to worry about succeeding in the eyes of the public any longer. It's okay for me. I, yeah. I did some of that. I got to do that. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, you've had a remarkable career. Uh, before we go, uh, I, I want you to offer, because a lot of the people I interview are up and comers. They're up and coming musicians, up and coming actors. What advice would you offer them? Well, I would say trust your instincts. Um, if you think you're walking into something that is not good for you, you probably are. Um, stay creative, stay engaged, stay healthy. You know, if you're wasting time because you're doing drugs or drinking or something, something, something that take time away from your, your effort, you see that you hear these stories of people who just consume themselves with singing and recording. I'm, I remember Robin, my son, Robin Thicke, um, when he was 12, he just sang all the time. He was always listening to people, learning new songs, learning new riffs. And, you know, now he's had this, he's have, is having this wonderful career and had the fabulous blurred lines. And, uh, you know, so I think just really, really do everything you can to know your area. My 10 year old grandson, Julian Robinson, um, knows all these wonderful singers and, and, you know, from 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, and he's studying and he sings all the time and he's always testing his voice and trying to expand his range and he's 10. So, you know, he's starting so early that it's just in his bone. It's what he, in his bones, it's what he has to do. Yeah. So you know, just, just go for it. 